us, whether it's a video or podcast on your favorite platform, please like and subscribe to us so that you can get notification of when a new show is released. You can also find us on major social media platforms. If you go to MiamiGhostChronicles.com, you can find links to the videos or MP3 files, which you can download and enjoy without commercial interruptions. If you're into classic horror, ghost, and adventure stories, I narrate Nightshade Diary, and you can find links at NightshadeDiary.com. If scary stories are your bag, and listening to encounters with cryptids, ghost, dogmen, and other weird creatures sends a shiver up your spine, then go to SupernaturalStoryTime.com for links to our weekly podcasts. Noteworthy news about the paranormal world, true crime, conspiracy stories, and anything that is just plain weird can be found at eerie.news or visit the Stranger Than Fiction Stories tab at MiamiGhostChronicles.com. Please subscribe to my newsletter on Substack. Just go to mppelliser.com for a link. I want to thank you for being part of my audience, and I think you are all wonderful. Hi, how's everybody doing? Good, I hope. This is my caveat for the show. Do you see? You see what this is? It might look like a squirt bottle to you, but today this is my enforcer, and this is the enforcer for my my pack, because the show is coming to you virtue of my of my generator. Because this morning Hurricane Idalia came across north of me. And it was a bit overblown as far as all the hype that was going to happen. But what it did do was that it took the power down where I'm at because we have a lot of, out where I'm at, we have a lot of large trees. When I say large, very tall. And most of the, because remember I live out in the sticks, a lot of the utilities are above ground. So when one of those trees comes down or a limb, that's it. And I'm thinking something big must have gone down because I want to say, I woke up at around 6 a.m. just to look at the news to see where where it was going to come into in the Big Bend in Florida. And right about there, around 6, 6.30 in the morning was when the power went out. And the utility company we have, we have out here is pretty decent about restoral. As a matter of fact, you know, they, they'll tell you, they, they give you like an ETA, like, hey, we expect by whatever, two hours, whatever. Let's put it this way. That was 6 in the morning. And we're talking 12 hours later, nothing and no ETA. When your utility company gives you no ETA, that's not a good thing. So believe it or not, normally I would say my expensive generator, except when you're having an experience like I'm having right now, it's not expensive anymore. It's like the best, brightest idea me and my husband ever had was to get that generator. Because let me tell you, and I'm sure all of you, wherever you're at, have noticed that the weather's been really hot. And over here, it's been hot. It's in, no breeze. And that's another thing. In the 90s with no breeze. And yeah, now we have a lot of breeze, but still. And um, it would have been insufferable. Um, and you know what? I, I've been in situations before where I've had uh, a generator, like the regular, the smaller generators that really most of the stuff that you can do with it is plug, you know, your refrigerator, a fan, uh, you know, stuff. It's not made in... It's great. Let me tell you, I'm a wimp. I'm a wimp. I agree. I admit to it. I'm a wimp. I'm a wimp. And I don't care. And uh, anyway, but I got them inside. And this is this is why I've got the enforcer going on. And and let me get on to make my own observations. I got to give my two cents worth in. I was born and raised in Miami from the cradle. I've dealt with hurricanes. All right. From the cradle. And I remember when I was growing up, when I was a kid, you know, we would bring down the awnings. Because, because in Florida and South Florida, especially, you have those awnings over the jealousy windows. Some of them, you know, are made of metal. And that's what we would do. And, you know, remember, we used to always make sure we had a um, battery operated radio and the hurricane lamps with a paraffin in it. That was it. And, you know, most people, I want to say back then, nobody expected nobody from, I mean, locally, government, nobody was going to come in unless, you know, it was like neighbors or like, my uncle lived across the street and everybody would come over to each other's house, help bring down the, you know, the, uh, if you had those shutters, these are the old time shutters, not the ones that you see nowadays. And maybe, you know, you would see some people even put like that scotch tape, like that masking tape on the windows, try to, one of those deals. That was it. And you hunkered down and you wrote it out. All right. 
And what can I say? I guess because when you live long enough to know the difference, don't get me wrong. It seems that we suffer nowadays from one extreme or the other. The way, don't get me wrong, I understand as far as giving people a lot of warning and instructions about when you've got something coming in. I was getting, I was getting notifications from a county office that's not even the county I went in. It just went out, you know, it's a county that's west of me on the coast. And I was getting notifications of evacuations, you name it. And this, of course, you know, Idali was supposed to come in somewhere around the Big Bend uh, of Florida. And, you know, the and, and I understand as far as the surge, the all of that. But it was hyped up so much that you, it was, I'm going to use that work, apocalyptic. Right. And having, like I said, been raised in an area where you deal with hurricanes, it was like, this is a little bit overdone. All right. This is a little, don't, I can understand where it's, and then I understand some people still say, you know, there's a lot of new people that have come to Florida that are not familiar with dealing with hurricanes or evacuations or the dum dums that run a generator inside their house and end up dying. I get that, but it was so overblown. And the reason why I say this is, I was watching a lot of these uh, news outlets just to see what they were saying. Like, is, is everybody on the same uh, page? And it was like, man, end of the world. And now I'm going to make a comparison. A few weeks ago, we had this horrible fire in Maui. And you see that these poor people over there got little or no warning um, as far as what was happening with things, with systems in place. And I was like, man, what is wrong with this comparison? You know, one side you have where you have all this modern technology as far as uh, availability to tell people. And like I said, God, I, I don't have a siren or anything out here. There's, I live out in the middle of nowhere. And I mean, you're, you're, I was constantly being bombarded for days with messages like, hey, be careful and do this, don't do that, get food. Blah, 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 blah. It was like, oh my God, okay. And then you see by comparison, all these poor people that even though that was not an anticipated event like a hurricane, but there's so many ways to reach people instantly besides an alarm, this, the phone, you know, everybody carries one of these things around. That sometimes I was like, what's wrong? There's something wrong here with this picture. But that's just my, I still haven't figured it out with, even though I have my own theories as to why one versus the other, and there's no middle ground. And anyway, luckily, of course, Idalia, it's, I don't even know right now. I think it's, it's already in Georgia somewhere. <laughs> and they might even loop back to Florida. Who knows what's going to happen with that. But again, um, if you hear a hum in the background, that's my generator. It's it's outside, of course. So, and that's that's my weather story for today, for this week. So let's get on to the good part. Let's get on to the paranormal, shall we? Yes, of course, Marlene. The good part is who the guest is. This is the first time this gentleman is on Stories of the Supernatural. His name is Larry Lawson. And he is, used to be, what was it, from detective to paranormal investigator. In the world of paranormal investigations, certain individuals stand out for their commitment, expertise, and unwavering curiosity. Larry Lawson, a former police detective who transitioned into a full-time paranormal investigator, has become a prominent figure in the field, known as the host of the captivating radio and TV show Paranormal Stakeout, which is broadcast on the X-Zone Broadcast Network. He dedicates his time to exploring the mysteries of haunted locations with a primary focus on Indian River hauntings in Florida. Yes, he's a native Flor of a fellow Floridian. Uh, he, uh, his Larry Lawson's unparalleled transition from the realm of law enforcement to the supernatural was not merely a change in profession. It was a calling. Drawing upon his extensive investigative skills and a natural ability to uncover hidden truth, Lawson has ventured into the realm of the unknown. Motivated by a deep desire to explore the paranormal, he has dedicated his life to studying ghost hauntings and other unexplained phenomena that emerge under the cover of darkness. Help me welcome him. How are you doing today, Larry? I'm doing great, Marlene. Thanks for having me on. I'm uh, <laughs> southeast of you, so I, I missed all of the fun. No, you know what? Usually the eastern coast of Florida is the one that gets spanked when it comes to hurricanes or a threat. Well, yeah, we've we've gotten quite a few here. I mean, my first one was Hurricane David down in Miami. I think it was 79. Yeah. I think yeah. it was the first, my first. So yeah, yeah we, I remember. I our, remember David. 
<laughs> we've had we've had our share here, including back to back ones. He talked yeah. about that hurric this hurricane looping back happened to us in 04. We got hit by a cat, just dropped from a three to a two. A week and a half later, another one that came across straight looped around, hit us again, another two. So yeah. Right. I, I remember, I, you know, people don't realize when could before Katrina went into New Orleans, you know, it came through Miami as a category one. That's that's right. That's right. People don't realize that it just Katrina was making mischief even way before it hit New Orleans. And I lived I lived way down south in Homestead, not actually in Homestead, but when Andrew came through in 92. Oh, yeah. Another ah, uh, let me tell you, that's Bad, what I'm saying. Worst. I've I've yeah, You've, I've been there. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So, Talk about I, for me. I I was like that. So anyway, now that we we're hurricane veterans for anybody wanting to know. Go ahead. What we we were talking right before we started to record, and even though I know you're going to tell me about your first paranormal experience, did you ever have anything happen to you as a kid? Now that you look back, no, no. no. I mean, not not nothing that stands out. And that's a an interesting comment because how many folks do uh, you speak to on your show? Certainly on on my show, Paranormal Stakeout, I uh, I, I talk to folks about it. They were having experiences seven, eight, nine years old, maybe even younger. Uh, All right. I I did not. Uh, now that's not to say there weren't some things that happened that might, uh, you know, look, if if I knew about them, if I remembered them, they might delve into the paranormal. My brother did. And my brother had experiences, but no, I did not until I was 20, 20 or twenty one. So, and the reason why I ask is that some people, when they're kids, they have experiences and they know right in that moment that it was like this is weird, this is whatever. And then sometimes some things, especially when you're a kid that you're more open-minded, it's only when you get older that you look back and you go, you know what? That there was there was something there, you know. But when you're a kid, you just like or a teenager, God forbid, when you're not yeah. even really paying attention to that. So what happened that first time that you had that paranormal encounter? Well, as you mentioned, I'm a, a career law enforcement officer. I spent about 40 years in the field total, uh, wow. both doing active police work. Uh, I was was a police academy director for a number of years uh but, uh, but i'm a detective by trade but i got my start in the dade county jail in miami i know we're uh, talking about that yeah down there in the downtown the big building and mm -hmm. uh i was i was just a kid i was like i said tw i don't even think i was 21 yet i think i i think i was still 20 and they'd sent me up to one of the floors to relieve they were shorthanded i think is what it was and uh, I was, it was the fourth floor and I'm, I'm sitting in the control booth up there and uh, you know, I'm still excited. I, I brand new on the job, you know, and uh, I'm in the control booth looking forward and we had three wings of cells and then a catwalk that went around the entire uh, floor. And at the end of each wing was a, uh, a bar gate that showed the catwalk and that we would that way you could go down each wing to check the cells, but then you could check the cells from the catwalk also. So I'm looking straight ahead and I see a figure, nothing spectral about it. Nothing wispy about it. It was a solid figure walked right to from right to left, right in front of me. No, no mistaking it. I hollered to the guys behind me. Hey, the Lieutenant's up on the catwalk figuring he was trying to catch us horse around or whatever. Right. So they went out the back door of the, of the of the control booth, which leads right into the uh, uh, catwalk. And bear in mind, the only way you could get up there is right in front of me, to the, just off a little bit with the elevators. And then there was a stairwell right in back of the control booth. Okay. So that's the only two ways I could get up. So the guys went out the back. One went right, one went left. They went all the way around. And they came back. They said, Lawson, um, sounds like ghost dogs there. <laughs> um, those are not ghost dogs. Those are like, <laughs> see, I have it already in hand. Keep going. Anyway, so they went out. They they both went one went right, one went left. They went around. They came back and they said, Lawson, there's nobody up here. And I said, I'm telling you, I just saw him. And they both looked at me and said, this place is haunted. Stuff like that happens all the time. Don't worry about it. <laughs> so that, that was my first experience that I could definitely put my finger on. And then, of course, you know, uh, in the not too distant future, I end up going to the police academy, going out on the road, working midnight watch like many rookies do. And you have things that happen. And, you know, we didn't talk about stuff like this back then. I mean, mm -hmm. we may talk about it briefly to each other. But back in those days, 
you didn't make a big fuss about it. Otherwise, your uh, your uh, boss would send you for a fit for duty psych exam. So yeah, you, just, you kept you kept didn't... it quiet. Yeah, not anymore. It's it's really changed. Yeah, to be honest with you, and uh, uh, so you know the little things happened, and you, you cops get this thing. You know what? Don't stop this car just yet, or wait till your backup gets here. Something's just telling you, and we just pass it off to just cop instinct, gut instinct. Right. So time went on like that, and then it was a uh, it was years later that the final straw, if you will, that got me really uh, wanting to investigate. And I'd always had an interest in it. I, I might add, uh, always found it fascinating, always wondered, but nobody, like I said, talked about it then. Um, then came the early part of the this uh, the twenty first century here, and uh, the ghost shows start coming out. My oldest son, who's uh, now uh, an adult living north of you up in Gainesville. Um, wanted to go to St. Augustine because he'd watched one of the old TV shows, Ghost Hunters, one of the old Ghost Hunters shows where they had an event in the lighthouse in St. Augustine. All right. And uh, we, I took him up there for his, I think, 10th or 11th birthday. And we went through this terrific tour, if I can make a, a plug at the, at the uh, lighthouse, Dark of the Moon tour. And we went through it. We really enjoyed it. And Ryan says, Dad, I'd, I want to do it again. So we bought tickets for the second tour. The guy running the tour says, look, you guys did this once. I got a smaller group. I'll tell you what, uh, I'm going to take everybody else to the light keeper's house. You two can be in the lighthouse by yourselves for about an hour. Cool. Oh, wow. Great. So Ryan and I are sitting in the fourth floor of the, of the uh, lighthouse, which thick walls, you can't hear from the outside at all. And I, and I briefly need to tell you back when the lighthouse was being rebuilt in 1879, the construction foreman had uh, three daughters. Two of them died in an accident there and had been reputing. Right, to, that they had fell been in that little roller, little thing and went into the exactly, water. Yes. Exactly, exactly. The pity, and, uh, pity, last name of pity. Yes, pity. Yeah, yes. yes. So uh, we're in there and they supposedly have been haunting the place ever since. Mm -hmm. We're sitting on the fourth floor. Clear as a bell, we hear kids laughing. No wow. mistake. Now, you'd, you'd have to know my son, very serious young man, even at that age. No question. But as a cop, what's the first thing I'm doing? I'm looking for speakers and wires, figuring yeah. they're putting nothing. Yeah. And that's really what um, put together. I said, I, I need to find out what this is. So uh, I got a few other like minds together, some teachers, some other cops. And we created the Florida Bureau of Paranormal Investigation. Okay. And uh, started investigating after a few years. Uh, you know, uh, I people started to want to, wanting to know what we were doing, what we were up to. And we wanted to share not only our paranormal experiences, but our love for history. So I created Indian river hauntings and that's sort of my outreach for the, for the okay. FBPI is Indian river hauntings. And we do historical events and, and ghost events, that type of thing. Well, let so. me tell you the, um, it's really funny because so, and sometimes um, some of these locations People think automatically because, you know, that tragedy, it, it got a lot of attention. Mm -hmm. You know, there was other children that died that didn't belong to the right. sister. It was kind of right. very tragic yeah. even then. Right. But sometimes, you know, there's there's other usual suspects that also have something to do. They just never, you know, never received the recognition. That's why sometimes mm -hmm. you go to some places and people actually end up witnessing or seeing something that's like, I'm, you know, who, who, what's this like? What's this? I never heard of anything like this man or let's say haunting this place or whatever. Um, but yeah, the, um, that thing, I want to go back real quick to that thing with, when you had that first experience in the prison. Okay. Sure. And I think that's so interesting because everybody sometimes thinks that a ghost sighting, sometimes they're so solid that you actually think that it's a Absolutely. real person. You do not think you're looking at something paranormal at that moment. You know, they're you're very, thinking very it, true. Yeah. Everybody thinks that it's going to be either filmy or transparent or some different color or it's glowing. Depending, you might have. I've a lot of people will have sightings that not till later do they realize this was a supernatural thing. They but they mistake it for a real person. Yes, did I? And and to this day, I I that's is absolutely embedded in my memory. There was nothing spectral about it. That mm -hmm. was a solid human figure I saw. So, so yeah, you started totally going into. You. Let me ask you, and I'm, I'm sure you did. You, I'm sure you, like you said, when, when you hear these kids laughing, you're looking like, okay, all right. I, no wonder that guy let us hang out here by ourselves. You know, he's got a speaker somewhere and, you know, mm -hmm. he's, he's probably maybe, you know, thinking he's any minute, these guys are going to run out of here. Um, 
And a lot of times, you know, I, I want to say exactly like you said at the uh, right when the paranormal reality show started to become, mm -hmm. you know, uh, I know that there's some people that I can I tell you, I don't know if you've you probably have come across it, especially when you used to do police work that you can tell when some people has have had a genuine scary experience versus somebody that's like it's very the story is very contrived kind of thing yeah. you know mm -hmm. that you could tell by the just the, the way they deliver because i've been doing paranormal investigations since the 1990s this was before even that and it was like when everybody wanted to keep it on the on the down low like no we're not going to talk about that because people are going to think i'm crazy right. kind of deal in other words this thing of a van pulling up in front of the house and they're kind of come out with cameras it was like no 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 um and you could tell when you speak to people like that, when you go oh, for lack of a better word, when you interview with them, you know, that you can tell that there's real fear in their mm -hmm. eyes, in their face, in the way they talk about things. That is like, man, even if there's something going, whether it's paranormal or not, these people believe there's something really here that's going on. And I think that's what's really helped myself. As well as some of my teammates, because I am on my team. I have uh, other folks in the public safety field, police officers, retired police officers and whatnot. We're, we, we're, we learn how to interview people. We learn facial expressions, body movements, things like mm -hmm. that. And that's been a huge help in us being able to separate the wheat from the chaff, if you will, from uh, yeah. something that had, like you said, they may, it, it may not be paranormal, but this person's believing it as compared to another person that is just trying to blow smoke up your uh, hind end. Yes, mm -hmm. so, exactly. Exactly. And you could tell it's like, okay, you, you got this story, you know, already like, you know, rehearsed kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, yep. I, t I tell everybody once upon a time, by the time, again, this is like you said, now it's become more mainstream. It's not like there's no stigma attached to it, but once upon a time where it was, people were like, no, let's, this is confidential. Right. Um, by the time somebody got called in to look at a paranormal aspect, they had a, they themselves had ruled out. They had called the electrician. They had called the plumber. They had called sure. the, the pestis. They themselves had tried to rule out what it was. And by the mm -hmm. time they got to you, it was like, I, I don't know what it is. Nowadays, if they hear a noise, weird, of course, everybody runs out and sleeps in the car and, and assumes it's a ghost. Nobody ever mm -hmm. does the, uh, hey, let me find out what this is. Is it trying to find the logical answers right. to the problem first? Is it a trapped animal, you know, that got stuck? Mm -hmm. uh, anything like that? Uh, they don't. That's that's the only thing. And I want to say that back before it became, I ran across more cases. That I want to say even in some cases they were darker or more severe because people uh, kind of like came to look for help as a last ditch thing. Mm -hmm. This is like, I don't know. And in many cases, sometimes they had even gone to local clergy and they had been kind of poo-pooed away or, you know, that kind of deal. And they were like, I sure. don't know what to do, you know, um, help me. I, I can't explain this. And I've, and they'll tell you, I've done this, 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 and this, and I don't know what to do. Well, you know? I, and I think th there's two sides to the T the, the TV shows. First of all, we all must realize they're for entertainment. Oh, yes. That, you know, they, in fact, a lot of the show, and I've met a number of the folks, and they are they truly are decent individuals with the right heart, but it's a TV show. And they might spend a week on a spot to give you an hour show, and you think they're getting everything right away. And that certainly has, in my opinion, created an issue, a false expectation, a false uh, yeah. anticipation from folks. And certainly made this whole paranormal investigation research uh investigation research field look easy and fun the reality yeah. of it is oh it's, God, it's yes. very it's very boring i i like to equate a paranormal investigation to a police stakeout you know you watch it on tv or the movies it's bang bang shoot them up it's yeah. all excitement the reality is that the most one of the most boring things you could ever do you'll sit sure, for hours and hours and hours and get nothing and then 30 yeah. seconds of adrenaline Yes, if if you're lucky, if you're lucky, if you're lucky. because you might just like me, look, like, yeah, and that's what you know. I I said this before in previous shows where I tell them, you know what, exactly what you just said. You know, these shows, of course, they have X amount of time. They have a production crew, by the way, in the background, yep. doing all the legwork, uh, and 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 of course, let's face it, nobody's gonna watch the show if they really did put some of these investigations the way they really were, where people are like. You know, doing one of these, or maybe you're walking around sure. temps. You know, otherwise you'd be like, "This is boring." 
And like you said, a lot of people, they get into the paranormal work thinking, oh, this is so excited. And it's really funny because I, I, I worked for many years in a, with a research foundation for the state of Florida. And besides I would handle the cases usually in South Florida, they would call me for members for an investigation, the people that would fall through, because guess what? A lot of times these investigations can only take place in a weekend because the homeowners, that's when they're home. So mm -hmm. all these new paranormal investigators, when they tell them, hey, yeah, it's we're going, going out there Friday or Saturday night. What do you mean? Friday, Saturday night. Yeah. That's when the homeowner's there. That's when they can let us into the house. Huh? Mm -hmm. You mean the weekend? Mm -hmm. Yeah. The weekend. That would be the end of the paranormal, <laughs> the mm -hmm. paranormal hunter thing. But um, so let me ask you, when you started going out there and doing the investigations with the, um, the, the Florida Bureau of Paranormal Investigation, did you ever run across a scenario? Because obviously once you get called in, you it should be something paranormal, but something that was, wow, this is beyond what I thought it was going to be. Yeah. Once you got there, it was like, Hmm. Okay. As if in the sense of perhaps an, an evil entity that needed something a little bit. Right. And this is not like, yeah, yeah something like, wow, even I can tell uh, either non-human or dark or just malevolent or intelligent, you know, because sometimes you get the yes. visual stuff. Yes. To, to, to all of them. We've been fortunate enough. Now, I got to put a caveat on this. One of the mistakes that a lot of teams make out there is making promises they can't keep to a victim oh, yes. or to a victim, excuse me, a, a, a client, yeah. shall we say. That's how they feel, though. But yes. I understand. Yeah. And, you know, we have to be careful. I talk a lot about this in eth the ethics. We're doing a paranormal class in a couple of weekends, uh, for example. And we're going to spend a lot of time talking about ethics. And uh, in that, you can't tell people that you can do something that you can't. Mm -hmm. um, and we could spend a whole thing on, on folks that like to sage houses and stuff like that, but there's really not, it takes a special person to have the talents to clear, clear a house. Okay. Yes. Um, so we've run into a couple of situations where we've had to bring in somebody that has um, some abilities that I don't, I, I like to joke around saying I'm as, I'm as sensitive as a rock. Uh, you know, I, I'm a guy that likes to, I, I like, yeah. I like evidence. I'm an evidence-based guy. That's what I did for my whole, my whole adult life. Um, but there are times that we've come across things that, yep, there's something here. And we've asked folks to pass them on. I, one case that came into, uh, in particular was a, a woman that, um, actually came to me because her son, her, she had a child that died um, as an infant mm -hmm. and her older son, it was an accident. I, I won't go into all the details, but it was a, truly an accident. And uh, the woman kept believing that her child was there. And that really was, and she, and she wanted the child to find it, find their way back. And we had somebody we brought in and they, they, um, that I had faith in, uh, they conducted a, a, an exercise that allowed the, per, the the child to go to go back to the other side. So yes, we have had that. Uh, but you know, once again, if we run into it, we have to say this is not this is not something we do. My team basically will go in, and what we like to try and do is identify a problem uh, through historical research as well as an yes. investigation. Absolutely. Uh, and try to identify the problem. If it's something that has to be dealt with on a spiritual end, we'll bring in folks that can do that. I want to caution folks that are really trying to maybe getting into the field for the first time. You just don't automatically get a, a, a bundle of sage and light it and move around a house and solve mm -hmm. a problem. Yes. By That's doing that, you can cause even more harm to the, the client because they think you're doing something to help them. And maybe you're really not. And yes. you just don't you just don't watch a couple TV shows and be able to do that. Does and that that's a problem. A lot of people think they read the books, they watch the shows. And I tell them nothing takes the place of field work. Nothing. I don't care how many shows you watch, how many books you read. If you don't do the field work of going, like you said, boring cases where you're like, you know, or whatever, or interviewing uh, people in a, you know, the family or an individual, that's really where you get the experience to understand when you come across something, what is it or mm -hmm. what is it? What is it not? 
what is it not exactly and if and once again the f rule of thumb is you go and you try to uh, find a, a logical answer for what's going on. I mean, when we we don't do a lot of residences for a bunch of different reasons, uh, but yes. we will on occasion. Um, but if we do do a residence, even if we're doing a, a, either a, a historical building or business, which tends to be our forte, uh, we do a, an in-depth interview. We talk to fo about who's in there, uh, what is their lifestyle like? Is there anything else that's been going on in there? Uh, Yes. Before we got there, i.e., seances, or is has, yes. uh, is anybody there unfortunately having any uh, mental health issues, any mm -hmm. addiction issues, things like that? Yes. We have to check all of that out. Yep. And then another part, and I, uh, from rambling too much, just holler at me, but is equipment. No, on the contrary. Uh, equipment. People watch the shows. Oh, man, it's got nice lights and it makes noise and stuff like that. But they really don't understand the foundation by why it works, how it works, what's the theory behind it, how to even use it properly. And that's a big problem that we see, too. And once again, our um, our paranormal course that we're putting on in a couple of weeks, we'll be spending a lot of time talking about equipment. Why does a spirit box work? What is, what is the theory behind it? And how do you use it? How are the techniques to use it? Because you just can't turn the thing on and expect to have answers it's a, it's a very technical field uh in that sense and you just can't pick up a piece of equipment and start using it and expect to be successful right and i've found because i tell everybody um usually uh they would do a lot of times they would do a scientific the the foundation i worked with even because i was always a freelance investigator mm -hmm. uh, they would do like what they call a scientific investigation basically rule out like what you said and if mm -hmm. it necessitated they would do basically a spiritual or psychic investigation but there was usually a pre-interview with the client or something just to get an idea a feel mm -hmm. for what you know what's really going on like you said as people say something a lot of times in between their words you know they oh, yeah. say or not certain things and so that you don't get any surprises because and, and i don't know if you could chime in on this i tell everybody you know even for the you know, when I tell people whether you're wanting to participate in a group or you're want, thinking maybe you need a group to come in and work in your house because you have a problem, I said, you need to look at groups that have been together because basically you're allowing them to come into your house. Or mm -hmm. the other side of it is if you're planning to join a group, you want to go into a group that has got a, a good leader. How's that? And rules. And the reason I say I this is, and I say, you know, everybody always thinks of the dangers of you know, if you go into a really malevolent haunting or something, I said, but you know what? There could be dangers as in physical dangers when you arrive at a location Amen. that you better have a good leader that might say, wait a minute, wait, whoa, 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 hold on. And might even back the team out because they find something when they arrive. Like, like we said, these paranormal shows have a, a production team that clears mm -hmm any un weird uh, locations or people you never see those mm -hmm. but as a team sometimes you might arrive somewhere and go oops wait a minute either the neighborhood's what? unsafe or somebody there like he says mental health problems it could run the yeah, my, my the lead the my my number two my second in command uh and he's the lead he's the lead field investigator when we go to investigation uh spanky uh is in charge of the field ops and okay. and he's a retired firefighter so the first like thing that. he does is go <laughs> go through a um, uh, the building and he looks for physical hazards too. Sure, yes. Uh, yes. Which is a good thing to bring up at this point. Folks, don't go anywhere where you don't have permission. Yes. Trespassing is a crime. Yes, yes, so. there it is. It is. Yeah, especially, you know, once upon a time, cemeteries, there was not a problem. But sometimes even now, you go into certain cemeteries and basically you're trespassing depending... You know, know the, the rules. rules. You might be just, yes, yeah. know the rules. Or even abandoned places that look abandoned. Mm -hmm. They might have an owner who, you know, that kind of deal. But yeah, and the reason why I say this, did you ever run across that where once you got to a certain place, you felt like this, <laughs> I don't know, like you feel uneasy. At, and I'm not talking here at the paranormal aspect. Since we're talking here ghost hunting, when it came to either the location, the circumstances, the people, something about it made you think, Oh yeah. Oh, we've, we've had that happen several times where uh, it had nothing to do with the paranormal. It was yeah. the, it was being situationally aware and it's like, 
you know, let's so uh, we either need to stay in the spot and not leave this area, or maybe we don't need to be here at all. Sure, that's happened. And and yes. once again, know where you're going. Take take some time to and, and there's there's some argument out there as to whether or not you should do a background on a place. Our take is you should do a historical background and find out what it's like there now. Look at the structure. Is it safe? Is uh, is it a place that is safe to bring your team in? When I bring my team in, I want to bring them home <laughs> in one sure. piece. Yes. yes. So, you know, we want to make sure that the area is, is conducive to an investigation. The area is safe. Um, things like that. And and then of course you got to deal with the paranormal side of it in case you're Yeah, that's that's just too. like that's from the real. Even even down to I hate to say it, some of these older abandoned places you might even have a squatter in there. <laughs> Almost people. There was there was a spot yeah. down in uh, West Palm Beach that we did with another team that had that exact problem in it and mm -hmm. uh you don't once again a lot of folks uh not to not to uh, uh put a, uh, a symbol on anybody, but, uh, you know, sometimes folks that perhaps are homeless, maybe squatting, they may have other issues, mental health oh, issues sure. that would cause them to strike out. And once sure. again, you don't want to get people hurt. So it's all, yeah, it's yeah, all part like, of oh, proper planning. Right. And this is, and, and we're mentioning this, which I'm glad because I want, for lack of a better word, that ghost hunting has been romanticized and they overlook a lot of the surroundings, like if you're really going to do the work, if you're really going to do this work, it's like, yeah, you know, yeah, you might worry about getting an attachment or possession or whatever, but there's there's a lot of stuff you got to worry about as far as the living is concerned. If it, you might even go into an area, I've there's places which if it's an older part of town, you know, in the daytime, you're okay. But if you go there after dark, the area has, the, the crime rate is higher. In other words, if you leave mm -hmm. your car, you know, wherever, you know, you got to look at all these things so that you I'll don't... tell you what, Marlene, I carried a gun and badge for 40 years then... and the living is much scarier <laughs> yeah. than the dead. Of I can tell you of that course. right now. Uh, so just you, you need to be careful. Yeah. A lot of people don't don't anticipate that when they do ghost hunting or doing a paranormal investigation, that that's something you have to consider, you know, mm -hmm. before, during and after. Now, let me ask you the same question, but did you ever... Um, because I'm glad you mentioned that, that thing about some people, they smudge and then, you know, two, three, four weeks later, whatever was happening comes back twice mm -hmm. as bad. Uh, mm -hmm. because well, have you ever gone in as a cleanup crew behind some other paranormal group? Oh, that yeah. Kind of like, oh yeah. Um, a couple of times we've done that. And what happens is somebody comes in and says, we'll solve your problem. They do, mm -hmm. they, they go in there, they do their thing. And then it doesn't go away. Now there's a couple of issues that go with that. First of all, was there a problem to begin with or did the person, the client have other issues that was, that was internal to them. I'll just put it that way. Sure. Yeah. It, there was nothing paranormal about it. And mental health, mental health, addiction. Yeah. And you know, Oh now. my, but here's the, here's what people don't realize. This group came in. They told me it was safe. Now that's back. I'll never be safe again. And then they do something because they give up and they do something to themselves. Yes. Who, yes. Who's responsible for that? You know, so, so yes, we've come in and uh, the first thing we're going to tell anybody is we can't tell you we can or can't do anything. Any, and, and I've got a, a, a medium that we work with in particular that flat mm -hmm. out says, is, I, I can't guarantee it that they won't come back. Yeah. I can send them over, but they can come back. Well, see, this uh, is the thing. A lot of a lot of people with those problems, I hate to say, are kind of a magnet sometimes. Oh, that's and it, it, I would agree. Whether it's whether it's paranormal or them, yes, mm -hmm. it can come back. But so the first thing we say is, look, you know, we cannot. We can tell. We can give you our opinion of what's going on here. We can bring somebody in that can perhaps give you some uh, some help. Mm -hmm. But nothing is guaranteed in this world. Heck, Marlene, we don't even truly. If we look at this honestly, we don't really even know what is on the other side. Sure. The other side lies, lies to us. You've get you, you for lots of reasons, all of you know, and, and I want to make sure I qualify this. Mediums don't always see the same thing. And it's mm -hmm. not because one side's being truthful, one's not. It's just because of maybe their life experiences, their their uh 
things things in their uh, in, in their realm, they may visualize something different. It doesn't mean necessarily that they're they're trying to be um, uh, how to put this. Uh, they're not lying. They just see it differently. What I'm getting at is we don't know what's on the other side. So if we don't really understand and know the complexities of the other side, how can we guarantee that we can deal with it? Sure. And, absolutely. And, and like I said, the, the medium that we use will tell you the same thing. Yeah, I know what I see, but I can't guarantee you what exactly is happening. So. And this is the thing, some of the people, if they have addiction problems or mental health, mm -hmm. and by the way, a lot of people think mental health, you could, you could be, how can I say, you could be kind of functioning normally as far as, but you might have a mental health problem. And Mm -hmm. I found in my experience that let's say you do go into investigator and you do bring in a medium or a psychic or somebody that knows what they're doing and they might clear the space, whatever. For some reason I have found people either whether it's their lifestyle their emotional makeup they're like mm-hmm. a magnet in other words you might say like what you just said that they could say hey it's back and it's no it's not back this is a new one <laughs> you know either because true, by the way true they go to certain places which are very dark or they hang out with a crowd which has something that walks with them and stuff like that well every once in a while hitchhike mm-hmm. and go home with you that kind of deal and see, yep. and that's the thing you think, okay, wait a minute. My job is not the morality police, no pun intended. You know, I'm here to help you solve a paranormal problem. I'm not about to lecture you on where you go or who you hang out with or what you do in your leisure. You know, all you can tell them is, hey, be careful because whatever. And don't, don't, don't go places where you're going to open yourself up to problems. Exactly. Exactly. And, and, and for some of these people, for some reason, the paranormal, I tell everybody, I'm sorry. Once you have that experience, you have to stay away from the paranormal. Don't do MVPs. Don't go hunting. Don't go to the cemetery because for don't some do reason, things in your house, you, Oh, oh sure. don't go, don't go hunt your own house. Let's no. just open the door and say, come on in folks. I mean, come on. Exactly. Because you have like a little, how can I say it? Um, you have like a little earmark on you that you just, it's easier for you to pick up stray stuff that, and then, and when that's when you have the stories of like, it didn't work. No, it did work. It's just that you did or something or went somewhere where you facilitated it or you even invited it. Like what you just said, Hey, Mm -hmm. I just got rid of this ghost. Let's, let's do this. Let's do the Ouija board. It's like, yeah, you dumb, dumb. Oh, I had, I had a lady one time. I had a lady one time, she had a, an entity in her, she she believed she had an entity in her place of mm-hmm. business and flat out said, yeah, and I invited her to come home with me and watch movies. Oh, see, see, see what I mean? That's exactly what I'm talking about. That you're like, yeah. all right, lady, you know? <laughs> yeah. So. Yes, that is what I'm talking about. That is exactly what I'm talking about. And, and I've had in... Some of my experiences where, you know, how, and you see some of these shows, I'm not going to, I'm not going to, I'm not going to blossom even though the show is not on where at the end of the show, they'll, they'll even find something, but they'll go, well, it's not malicious. It's not that. And, and you have people go, okay, no, no, no. Don't send him or her away or whatever. You know, I went on a few investigations where people really, what they wanted to do is identify the entity. Mm-hmm. And I tell them in my experience, this will go South eventually, you know, you having, uh, an entity that is bound to this plane living in your area. I don't care how innocuous it is at the beginning. It will eventually go south. Guaranteed. Guaranteed. I don't care if it's your grandma. I don't care if it's the old guy that used to live here. I, I And that thing about the kid, you want, you want to get me like really suspicious because the darkest, most malevolent encounters I've had in investigations, a lot of times start out with, a child, a child entity, mm-hmm. an intelligent haunting. Why? What's the usual response from most people, Larry, when you talk about a kid? Oh, okay, your guard comes down. You know, sure. It's just a, it's just a natural uh, thing for people. Oh, it's just a kid. Yeah, it's just a kid. Mm-hmm. Oh my God, the poor kid, the poor little kid, or the you know, your 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 natural uh, wariness comes down. Mm-hmm. And I say, I want you to think. And I know for a lot of people, it's hard. You have to think of that at some point you might have an entity that is, um, what's the word, manipulative enough 
to pretend to be something to bring you as an investigator, your guard down. And a lot of people don't ever think that there's things like that out there. Oh, the other side lies all the time. You know, it's just like people. Uh, So there's no doubt about that. I also have a, and this is just an opinion, once again, mm-hmm. going back to nobody really, really, truly knows what's on the other side. But I've also found that, you know, folks that may have passed when they were uh, 90 years old may mm-hmm. return, may legitimately return yeah. as a child. Uh, we've got a place in a little town called Selzmere. I don't know if you've ever heard of it, but it's in the northwest corner of our county in Indian River County. I think and it's so, an yeah. old school. It's an, There's the old school there it was the oldest brick and mortar school in the area. No recorded disastrous history at all. Nobody's died in there. There's never been an accident. Yet the place is full of kids. Sure. Full of kids. We've mm-hmm. we've documented it. Our belief is it's just where some of them come back because that's where they were the happiest. I mean, yes. that's a theory. Yes. That's that's a theory. Yeah. But yeah, they they'll they'll come and go in they'll in whatever form they want sometimes. Let me tell you, workaholics, workaholics sometimes don't go back home. They go back to where they worked. That's where they were. This was their place. They were a workaholic. Yeah, Yeah. that's true too. Yeah. And then, like uh, you said, you look at the history, nothing bad ever happened or, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, that's because really what they're, what they're drawn to is, like you said that, how's this for a workaholic working is happiness. As strange as that sounds. Well said. Okay, I, I I can I can actually. And agree I'm gonna say because a lot of these jobs, and, and but I'm sure you agree. Once upon a time, there was um where people would work 20, 30, 40 years at the same location, where not yeah. only was the job you developed like a second family with the people you worked with, mm-hmm. and in other words, there's also that emotional attachment because you spent so many hours there. Where you you saw people get married, divorced, buried, funerals, weddings, you know, good times. Because there was this so many years that you worked there that a lot of people, even if it's not a workaholic scenario, I'm saying people get Mm -hmm. drawn back because, like you said, this was an emotional place for them. Energy, emotional energy. energy. It was it was energy. It was like, hey, this was the place that I was happy, felt fulfilled, or I had a lot of my friends. This is where I hung out, and I. You know, I felt good, you know, yeah. and uh, that sometimes that's why sometimes you will have hauntings or things that you're like, I've done the, the research on this location and I don't come up with anything on this. And but that's yeah. the source. Yeah. Too many people think, oh, if there's a ghost here, somebody had to die here. Right. No, no, that's that, that's that's a that's a fallacy. Um, they just may enjoy being there. Well, I tell people once upon a time, guess what? People dying at home was a normal thing. This is, of course, a few decades back, but people, mm-hmm. it's, you know, nowadays, you know, most people, unless they fall over and die, but they, if they were ill or they had a lingering disease, they were sent home mm-hmm. and they, uh, it was common for people to die at home. So if you would hear, oh, somebody died, it's like, okay, that, you know, that, that's normal. That was common. There wasn't mm-hmm. that much of the warehousing of ill people. Like there is now, um, very very true. It, it's not. It was a, how can I say it? It wasn't a morbid thing, in the sense of. You, I'm sure you've heard of people ha- that used to have wakes, you know, in the oh. parlors or in the downstairs of the house. And then you had the, and in some cultures you had a thing called a sin eater. I don't know if yes. you're familiar with that. Yes. Where they would actually come and they would consume food around the the decedent uh, to eat away their sins to to consume yes. their sins. And I would just I just saw some pictures today that talked about historically in not not in the 20 in the early part of the 20th century and just before it was common to take a picture with a decedent in order to honor them so you see lots of pictures with the family around i know some of them you look at them now with our sensibilities and you're like man that's 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 kind of like wow (laughs) (laughs) it's like okay yeah i'm not about to take a picture with any dead people even if it is families thanks but yes, I've seen those pictures. The other, uh, yeah, I was doing research, even children, and I was like, oh. mm-hmm. okay. But yes, and and it wasn't. It was like you said. It wasn't. First of all, because photo photography was in its infancy. You didn't have a million pictures sometimes of people, mm-hmm. something to remember them by. Which is why you had people that would snip off like a locket of hair, or as a yep. remembrance. And I'm going to ask you now, since you were in law enforcement, one of the things I tell people is. I've had investigations where the house is brand new. 
and nobody can figure out why, why is this happening? And sometimes Great it's topic. the land. How do Absolutely. you know if somebody didn't go out there and this was their place where they disposed of, <laughs> I'm getting dramatic here. This is the place but, but where they got you're rid spot of on. You're spot on. And, it, and especially where you're at now and down in my neck of the woods, there was yeah. a time where you could put them out there, uh, bodies yeah. out there and the gators would get. That yes. is a huge thing, Marlene, that people, I I just built this house. Nobody's lived here before me. Yes. Nobody's died. How could it be haunted? I got to, I'll bet you 80% of the time it's the land. It's what's happened yes. on the land prior to it. And I, I cannot even begin to tell you all the different times we've determined it was really the land where, where that's mm -hmm. the problem not the structure not the structure so, exactly yeah. and especially sometimes if even if you have a little neighborhood who were people after you get around and you find out depending on how close the houses are mm -hmm. where you find out that hey somebody's everybody's having some sometimes some weird stuff going on but you know sometimes people don't yeah. talk about that but there was and um well poltergeist was you know what the movie that, i'm talking about the movie no, there. No, no, yeah. absolutely that story back in the 1980s there's the um there was a place called black hope in texas it's, it was a little town what happened was it was an area i can't remember i want to say it was either on the outskirts of either dallas or houston but it was like out there and developers would sell you the piece of land and build you your house all right Mm -hmm. So they built, I think it was first, it was either like eight houses, you know, nice houses. And eventually people started having, they had one family, they wrote a book about it, made a movie eventually that they started having paranormal experiences. What happened, what supposedly ticked it off was, and if you remember Poltergeist where they were mm -hmm. building the pool, yeah, one of them, one of the neighbors, was it the one that wrote, they decide they're going to make a pool. Of course, they're already living in the house. And they have somebody coming in, you know, with a backhoe to make the mm -hmm. hole. And they said that some very older gentleman comes along and goes, hey, if you keep digging there, you're going to find some coffins or some bodies, something like that. And they're like, what, what are you talking oh, about? Yeah. And sure enough, they came up and they dug up two wooden coffins, like really old. Come to find out, they find out that once upon a time, there was a very, there was a small community of African-Americans that was called New Hope. They had a little cemetery. Now, this cemetery was never registered in the county. The reason why this is later on, these homeowners tried to sue the developer. Like, hey, you built us a house on the graveyard. But the developer themselves never knew because that cemetery was never registered officially. Okay. And the years pass. And of course, you know, those markers are made of wood. They're mm -hmm. long gone. Anyway, what triggered the haunting, which was pretty severe, was once they started digging the pool and they had a bunch of different things go on and pretty, you know, they all, they all really, the eight people eventually left. <laughs> they left and they tried to sue and it was a big, this was happened in the 1980s. My point being besides uh Hey, I'm going to dump this body out in the middle of nowhere. Like you said, sometimes you'll have burial places that are not official. Like if you look them up in the records for research purposes, mm -hmm. you're never going to mm -hmm. know. That you might have 30, 40, maybe 50 people buried out there. Well, and that's true, but even take it a step further. Gettysburg. Yes. That that yes. I mean, the, the violence and the tragedy that occurred uh, on those very hollowed grounds, uh, to this day, people continue to have experiences because of the land, because of what happened there. Yes. Um, so that that energy now, one just to toss something out at you, one of the big arguments I see in this field right now is uh, the difference between residual and intelligent haunts. Mm -hmm. Is a residual haunt or the trapping of energy from an event or a person, is that truly a ghost or is it just the energy replaying itself? I think that something will weave itself or imprint itself in the tapestry, but this is on a metaphysical level. Mm -hmm. And I'll give an example because I've run into this a couple of times. You know, you let's say you go buy or rent a place, whatever, a house, an apartment, it's all painted, spick and span, it's beautiful. You'll use one room. And if it, let's say at some point that might have been a sick room. Okay. Mm -hmm. And you might have somebody eventually start developing symptoms, which they cannot account for, by the way. And of course, nobody's ever going to say, yeah, you know what, for maybe a year or a year and a half or so, a few months, somebody that was really ill, this was their room. 
I'm not talking a mm-hmm. couple of weeks. I'm talking about, and they had certain symptoms. And when you look at the room physically, it looks what? There's nothing there, paranormal, scary, you mm-hmm. know, it's not falling apart. But there's something that imprints itself, I want to say, on the tapestry of a place, especially through repetition, repetition mm-hmm. or high emotions. Yep. And I'm sh- I don't know if you've come across it. You know, people will say, hey, after I moved to this place, man, we're having arguments and it's everybody's always on edge and mad, you know, and it's like, really, really? And they'll say, yeah, we leave. And sometimes if there was a place where there was a lot of, but, but I'm not talking about regular arguing. Okay. I'm not talking about everybody has arguments. I'm talking maybe at a really dysfunctional level. Almost Con- like a change of personality. Systematic. That mm-hmm. feeling stays linear there where people, even if you're not sensitive, how's this, that move in, they start picking up whether it were, there was depression or dysfunction or just arguments and, and they'll react. They themselves th- don't get it. Mm-hmm. You know, why did mm-hmm. behave a certain way? But yes, as far as the residual, I've had uh, things of like, let's say, uh, let's say coffee brewing, the smell of coffee brewing or bread baking, let's say early, really early in the morning. Mm-hmm. Something that was done a lot or uh, same thing. This is especially in older houses, even though I've heard of it where places have replaced an older structure where they'll hear somebody like going up and down the stairs when and it's residual. No yeah. Well, there's, there's no stairs and it's just a residual thing. It's just something that became imprinted, but there's no intelligence. There's no spirit there. Mm-hmm. That's going to say there's, there's nothing to, you know, it was just something that happened over and over and over oh, and over. And let's face it. Humans are creatures of habit. We are. But, but that also goes to what I had mentioned earlier about, we really don't know how the other side works. Oh, no. And that's no. why we need to, we need to continue to research. We need to continue to study. We need to keep continue to gather information to try and find out what this really is and what what the connection is onto the other side. Because there's no question it's happening. Yeah. There, I mean, there's no question that there's things that are going on, whether it's spirits from the other side, dimensions the way uh, Einstein talked about them in his general theory of relativity, our own brain power, whatever this is. Study and research has got to continue to kind of get the answers, my opinion only. Well, no, and you'll see some people will say if they've actually had a sighting where that spirit or ghost seems to be totally unaware of the humans. It's almost like it's doing its thing. Sure. It's like sure. it's it's doing, it's following whatever it did. And then the mm-hmm. other ones that you could see, this it's aware of me. It's like, wow. And yeah. that's why I tell everybody, you know, everybody thinks of, I'm going to go at night. And that's when the hauntings, I said, you know what, if you've got a haunting that's being dictated by what this person did, maybe that morning time during the daytime is when they were doing their thing, (laughs) you know, as far as activity, if they're following a pattern, a repetition Mm -hmm. of their behavior, I'm going to Mm -hmm. say housewife, let's go down that route. And they spent their whole day in the mornings. And I had my own experience with this early in the morning with somebody going through my, um, which is why it woke me up. I was awake. I take that back. I was awake and I was alone. And I heard, you know, when somebody opens a drawer and goes through the utensils and sure. then opens the, the things and clack, clack, clack. A part of me is like, uh, what? And I thought it was my grandmother. That's my audience has already heard this story before. So I'm going to say it again, guys. And I, my grandmother would never have come. She had the key. She had a, she lived across the tree. She had a key. She would never, she had real bad arthritis in her knees and she wouldn't have come over. She, but in that moment, I thought, I thought so it was, that's why I didn't work out. Sense. Yeah. Yeah. Plus all I hear is somebody rattling around in my kitchen, in the kitchen. You know, I was a teenager. That's why. Otherwise I would have totally like oh, lost it. But I was like, oh my, what? She's in there, man. I don't know. And I hear pluck, pluck, pluck in the drawers and the, and I was like, what is she doing? Then later on, it, I mean, I it covered me and it's a, it, let me just tell the story real quick. When I was, as a matter of fact, when I was going to Pace, that early conversation we had, okay, my mom sure. would be, go off to work first. She would tell me, if you're ever going to stay home, you need to call your grandmother, tell her you're staying home. You know, you have to do that. So that morning, I goofed off. I didn't want to go to, I didn't want to go to school. My mom left mm-hmm. and I called in sick to school. I just wanted to stay home. So like I said, I hear, I'm awake and I hear that clack, clack, clack stuff. And I was like, oh, my grandmother, shoot. 
And I'm, even though at that moment, I didn't think that she, she never comes over here. <laughs> and it was, you know, those older houses that's got the raised wooden floors that, mm -hmm. you know, when somebody steps on it, you hear it kind of creak, you can feel it. And I was in a bedroom all the way at the back of the house and in, in the, in the hallway. And I turned over and I go, I'm going to, my grandma is going to grill me like why I didn't go. And I turned over like pretending I was asleep. And I felt somebody come to the doorway of the bedroom. That's really strange because my grandmother was a short lady. But for some reason, I don't know how to explain this because my back was turned. But it felt like whoever was looking at me was much taller. Mm -hmm. Somebody paused at the doorway of the room, came up and pulled the blanket over my shoulder. It was like at my waist and pulled it up to my shoulder. And I was like, and I was thinking, and, and that's another thing. If it would have really have been my grandmother, she right there, she would have woken me up and said, what are you doing here? What are you Why doing didn't here? you go to school? <laughs> la, 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 la. It was one of those deals. Okay. I spent the whole day at home goofing off, watching TV, whatever. Price is right. Whatever. My mom would come home. She would, and then she would cross the street to go visit with my grandmother. Five minutes after I hear the phone ring, this is about five o'clock. Why didn't you tell your grandmother you were here at home? I go, she knew. What do you mean? She, she, she was here in the house this morning. And I hear my grandma in the background. What? She's lying. I haven't been there. And I'm like, she was here. She was here. And my grandma, and by the way, my grandmother would not have lied. If it was her, she would have said, yeah, and yeah. what? Yeah, she would have lied about this. Beaten like, you for not going to school. And I, Right. Oh, yeah. She would have like, I was like, but, and well, it hung up the conversation. And it was like, huh? But I was a teenager. So at that time, you know, when you really don't, Thinks that much about it. And around that time, this was when, you know, you used to have the long cords. And I used to be talking to my friends real late at night. And we would have the jealousy windows open. And every mm -hmm. once in a while, I would hear somebody walking around the yard. Now, the first couple of times we had those chain link fences. And I would, you know, when they click, click, clack, clack like that. And the first couple of times was like, again, when you're a teenager and you're engrossed at 1 a.m. talking on the yeah, on the phone. I was like, man, that's not a cat. That sounds like that's too heavy. Like that, you know, the gates where they. Sure. And then one time I'm talking to a boy, of course. He was a bus boy. <laughs> that's why I'm talking to him at 1 a.m. He had gotten out of work. And I hear somebody walking on the grass and you could hear by the footfalls. This is not an animal. Plus it was fenced. And I had grown up in that neighborhood, by the way. And. So much so that I said, hey, there's somebody in my yard. And he's like, hey, don't hang up. I'm like, what do you mean? I run and I jump into my mom, poor mom's bed. There's somebody, there's somebody in the yard. There's somebody. My girl, my mom was out. And she got up and we're like going from window to window. And there was no trees. There was no shrubbery here. Like for any, plus I didn't hear anybody like run off. And again, you know, the window level here are a little bit higher than normal because this is a raised flooring. You know, the, mm -hmm. the level of your windows are not, in other words, right. if somebody came up to a window, maybe it'd be chin high. Right. That happened to me twice. Okay. One time I was, again, the bedrooms were in the back of the house. And I was, I had a window right up here. I was at a desk and I had one of those desk lamps. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, I hear footsteps coming up to the window. And I was like, oh my God, if I look up, I was afraid I was going to see somebody's face looking at me. <laughs> that's, that's, that's how real it was the footsteps that i mm -hmm. saw coming up i just pulled my seat back and I, again my poor mom <laughs> oh, there's somebody in the yard my mom was like nobody there was nobody didn't hear nobody running away no 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 jumping the fence is these by the way these are the older um you know the neighborhoods would have an alley that runs between oh, yeah. in the, down the middle of the block what what part of miami was this this was in hialeah Highly, I was I, I was gonna guess Hialeah from what you're describing. Hialeah. Sounds, this was this like was Hialeah. Hialeah be, this was yeah. uh, <laughs> we moved to Hialeah when all they had out there were dairy cows. This was there was the West Hialeah. It was all East Hialeah. But anyway, but and, and and again, I grew up in that neighborhood and I knew all the neighbors. All the neighbors knew it was like one of mm -hmm. those deals. And I look, believe it or not, at that time I really didn't make the connection with the paranormal at all. It was only till later I was like, man. That's, and once upon a time when I lived across the street, my grandparents, there was an older couple who had brought up their daughter. The daughter moved away. She became a widow and she was the one that was renting that house out to us. 
The only thing mm. I can think of was that the gentleman that was married there came back, came back, was checking out, and these these that that develop those that, that development was built around the 1940s, like around World War II, mm -hmm. because you know down in uh, Northeast there used to have a German prison camp where there was a trailer yes, park. There was a lot of stuff. That's right. Yes. A lot of people yep. don't realize in Hialeah, when you go to the northeast, into the east end of northwest uh, Hialeah, there was, well, it became a trailer park and then there was a movie theater. But so a lot of that housing out there was built during that the 1940s time period, more or less. Mm -hmm. There was nothing, like I said, I thought it was a real person. I thought, hey, I got somebody running around in my yard trying to look in through one of the windows. I never thought paranormal. Okay. So again, a lot of times, as far as experiences of um, what you were saying about people coming back mm -hmm. to this is where they felt comfortable or they feel, I want to say for lack mm -hmm. of a better word, ownership, mm -hmm. or like when I felt that blanket was draped over my shoulders, you know, there was no, yeah, there, yeah. You, you see what I'm saying? So Yeah. And, and I, I think it's very, very likely that they come and go too i don't yes. think i think there there are probably some spirits that are bound here but i also believe that yes. there's others that just come and go they come back and check in when they feel the need and i think another one of the thing that we we got to remember is their understanding and use of time yes is a, probably a lot different than ours I'm and sure. what may be what may be three years for us might be 30 seconds for them we just we just don't yeah. know what the what what timeline is like on the other side either larry i'm going to ask you it's especially since you're more familiar with florida especially in south florida or have it better and i ran across this in my, in my investigations where sometimes you know there was a um either history or evidence of a cult like either santeria or voodoo or santeria, anything brujeria yeah brujeria yeah. alumayombe whatever Bye, in these yeah. houses and either the people practiced it did or moved into a house where they once did. And I came across sometimes, especially if they moved into a house where rituals had taken place, even if this family, that really, that was the source. And what people don't understand is that that uh, practice, even the Santeria that people say it's not as dark, you know, that they use dead people for divination. That's the way it works. Well one thing you don't know about me is I, for many, many years, taught cults and deviant groups investigations to, to oh law enforcement. Oh my God, you're and kidding! I spent, no, and I spent quite a bit of time uh, dealing with the the uh, Africa African Caribbean, Afro Caribbean from the diaspora, Palmeombe, Brujeria, Santeria, yes. which you know so many people have a different view of. But yes, I'm very, very familiar with what you're talking oh about, and yes, God. I. I do believe that. I was that so happy. I thought doors. you were going to look at me and go, Marlene, let's not go there. <laughs> no, no. I, I, I understand exactly where you're coming from. Okay. Um, yes. Yes. So, so okay. yes, I do believe that opens doors and, and that can cause things to linger too. Yes. I mean, yes. You, People you open don't the door and they realize just... that the practice, would... and I've, <laughs> I've seen people because see a lot of times what the, and I'm sure people have seen like the voodoo, you know, where they get what they call they're mounted by these spirits which is supposedly when in, in Santeria also I've, I've seen it. I've like, oh, where basically they use them for divination purposes that the spirit talks to them and gives them the ability to divinate. My point being that they sometimes go out of their way to attract spiritual energy. Okay. This, this carnets oh, yeah. because this is part of their, of their practice of the religious practices and let's not even go into the animal sacrifices things but yeah we, we could spend the next three days talking about that because yes. it's one of the things about these cults too is you'll get mm -hmm. a centero who is a who is maybe doing things the right way to the mm -hmm. practicing the religion the way it's supposed to be but then you get somebody that decides to take a dark turn with it oh, sure. and use those powers to do bad things so you can't you can't put them all into one big basket and say oh no they're no no they're, they're, yeah. no so, there's, uh, and there's some of them though that 
to the outside world, they're Santeros, they're Babalaos, they're, they're like, yeah, we're white, mm, you know, yeah, white yeah. magic, maybe a little bit gray, but behind the scenes, they do practice mm, dark magic, yeah, you know? Yeah, they just yeah. don't advertise it because um, I'm going to... It's, gonna, what the, situ it's oh, what yeah, the situation course. calls for, for that at that moment. What What's oh, no. in my best interest here? Oh, no, yeah. I'll tell you right now what it is. The darker it is, the more money they're going to get paid. That's oh, it. Bottom absolutely. Line. Absolutely. You know, I, uh, if it's dark, that's, hey, man, that's going to, you know, you're going to have to pay for that. And well, I, I, got, I got to tell you a quick story real quick. Yes. I was uh, on patrol. It was uh, in a city. Uh, it was in Delray Beach. I'll just flat out say it. I was a, a Delray Beach city police officer. And I chased somebody into the woods. Uh, after They ran for me. And I went chased. Mm -hmm. I was young and fast in those days. So I, I could outrun most but and i chased him into this wooded area and he disappeared mm -hmm. I'm, and i don't mean he disappeared he just got away from me but i suddenly stopped and i'm looking around and i'm seeing all kinds of what i now to be the accoutrements of, of i don't know santeria but i couldn't really tell at that point wasn't mm -hmm. as learned about it but i walked right into a, a den of that and you know the the the, the feathers and the, all the accoutrements to a to some sort of Afro-Caribbean cult type of uh, yes. uh, worship area. Let's just put it that way. And that was my, that was my first experience with that. Uh, I say that, but I did get hexed in the Dade County jail once because I, Oh, you got to tell me about that. Yeah. Now uh, there's not much to tell on that one. A guy came in and he, um, he uh, had a, a bag around his neck with his, uh, his uh, items in it that protected him. And I said, you got to take it off. No, you can't have it. You got to take, you got to take it off. So I, I took it off him and um, he cursed me right there. He just, you know, told me all kinds of horrible things were going to happen to me. And I just stood there and looked at him. And when I guess I didn't die, he just turned around and went back into the cell, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> didn't drop that. So, yeah. Didn't drop that. So, you know, there's a, just a funny story. But that, that event in Del Rey was the first time I'd really seen what was a worship area for Yes, for a, a, people, people a they, like they don't realize yeah. that. Um, you know, because you remember, uh, yeah, you were, I can't remember what his name is, when he got, got okay to sacrifice chickens in Hialeah. Oh, oh absolutely. God. Yes. I taught that. My, I, 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 I took that whole court case and went to the Supreme Court. Yes. And I it took, went all I the way. It, yep. I took that and taught, taught that, uh, talked about the that that case yes i remember right that's santeria light okay they mm -hmm. can go oh, into yeah. goats horses humans okay this is people don't realize there's a darker i'll give you uh an example you i don't know if you remember the the case of mark kilroy over in matamoros in mexico in 19 oh, Marlene. was that those all the kids that were killed this is the one where uh, he was a med student and for spring break, he went over, he crossed the border over to Matamo, um, Matamoros, to Matamoros yeah. yes, mm -hmm. which is, but it was normal because it was like, you could get cheap drinks and mm -hmm. he was abducted off the streets and his parents uh, started pushing, you know, like they really came down on the, uh, on the, well, the authorities here. And then of course, by extension in mm -hmm. Mexico. And come to find out, they found on all a ranch bodies. all the bodies, mm -hmm. him, but along with a bunch of other bodies yep. and the all the, the 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 things of what they call a bakwa, which is very very dark bakwa, black yeah. a magic. I mean, right. and they found him, and they it, it was horrible. Yeah. It was not just yeah. killing them; it was torture and the binding of spirits. And he had the padrino there, which was um, Jesus Con Jesus Constanzo. He had told them, I want a, a white, intelligent guy, a pre-med. And there you go, because the, the binding of the spirit, they need that. In other words, it wasn't just snatch somebody off the street, anybody. I want that specific type of person. All right. Well, if I'm if I'm not mistaken, if it was, I think it was this case, they were actually doing that because they felt if they sacrificed these people, it would it would make them invisible to the to the police. Well, they he, he had. This is the thing. Originally, Costanzo was here. He was he was born here. His parents, he was from Cuba, but he was born here. And he f grew up in this. Uh, and even his mom would praise him and, and torturing. Because this is what people don't understand. 
Mm -hmm. uh, with that dark magic, it's just not killing the animal. It's the suffering mm -hmm. of the animal yeah. that makes it, that, that that's what you want. So he grew up mm -hmm. as a child. I mean, I'm telling you, it, it, when you listen to it, it's like, no wonder he turned out to be, he was, but he grew up in that. His mother, his stepdad grew up in that. In the 80s, he goes to Mexico and he starts doing the occult stuff, the Santeria. And he, start, he, he starts getting people, either the cartels or even politicians, and I'm going to do this work for you just so things turn out mm -hmm. good for you and blah, 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 blah. In some cases, though, it was really funny because if he had people that were outside the law, he would pay off the police like, hey, make sure. You know, and of course, as far as the, the criminal, hey, your work is great. <laughs> I haven't gotten busted. Bottom line, he wanted to get into the action as far as this was the drug running back then. Mm -hmm. And he tried to get into one of the families because, you know, the cartels basically are family run. And mm -hmm. one of them, they are like, no, we, you know, we want to use you for religious protection, but yeah. not, not, you're not going to, he got rid of like six other people that, of that family. And then he approached another one. Uh, which he made a connection through a, a girl that she went to. She's, I think she's still in, in prison for this. And he got introduced and they were the ones that were the owners of this ranch out in Matamoros, which is on the outskirts, which is like with, like in other words, in the middle of the, out there. And they, they had killed a bunch of people and were burying them out there, very shallow graves. And, but part of his power was, uh, you know, that he had clients and the, the, the ones that really paid were the ones that were the cartels. Like, Hey, do whatever you need to do, but don't let me get busted. Yeah. And, uh, but of course, when that thing happened with Mark Kilroy, all these other people had disappeared. Unfortunately, there was nobody out there. They weren't going to go to the police and say, Hey, mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm missing my cousin, my aunt, my, my son, <laughs> you know, they disappeared off the streets. And mm -hmm. that's how it, it all went down from there. And he ended up committing. Well, no, he had one of his followers when they finally caught up to him in Mexico City, um, shoot him. And what's really funny is a lot of people don't know this. They brought his body back here to Miami. All right. But and they did a second autopsy. He had like 16 bullet holes. They buried him. They're saying that back then, the 1980s, which I believe it's so, the only Catholic cemetery in Miami-Dade County is Our Lady of Mercy. But mm -hmm. they had to bury him in secret somewhere out in that cemetery because they were afraid people were going to he, he was gonna have followers even in death. How's that? So oh. they supposedly buried him in secret somewhere, like nobody knows where in the cemetery he's buried. But like that, you will come across that. And my point is it's when I say dark, I'm talking about dark. Yeah. Where sometimes you will go on an investigation, and I'm not saying the family that's there is doing that but what happened there it's, it's residual. Still lingering yeah, it's lingering sure. i i did one where they had buried something the 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 family as a matter of fact was from australia they they rented this beautiful nice big house with a lot of grounds on it whoever was there before i think i think it was the landlord's family i'm not i don't remember correctly but they had buried something and they started having a bunch of stuff <laughs> i mean really bad stuff going on with them and it all really where the, the source of it was that very dark uh, curse that was put on there. My point being that it wasn't, it, even if they weren't the intended victim, just because they started living in this place. Mm -hmm. Wrong place, wrong time. They got the blowback on it. Um, yeah. So I, you know, because I, I, you know, you'll get a lot of people say, well, you know, only bad things happen to believers, true believers. Okay. Mm -hmm. but that I know that they dabble in very dark and bind spirits and stuff like that. And that's why you sometimes have uh this car. When I, when I mean discarnates, I'm not talking about what you were saying. Somebody that's like grandma, grandma comes back on the anniversary and you smell her perfume and then she's gone. I'm talking about yeah. discarnates, you know, where you have a spirit that's never gone on to the other side and they're earthbound yeah. for whatever reason, or they were bound to serve in those big, uh, what they call the nagangas, the, the those big the, the, the nganga, yeah, okay, yep, stuff like that. But again, um, it's it's. Oh, let me show. Let me show. Oh. Go go ahead. I want to just show you something here. No, no, go ahead. Uh, 
this uh Oh, yes, my, there we go. African magic and Latin. Yes. <laughs> one of my uh, one of my books that I used to teach from. And of course, the tales of the Orishas. Well, you know what? And 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 I want you to speak to this, Larry. You know what? There was there were um a lot of times that they say that law enforcement would arrive at certain crime scenes and not recognize occult oh. symbology or occult stuff. Absolutely. Because everybody thinks, Absolutely. oh, yeah, if I see a pentacle, but sometimes the um, the hints or the the symbology is unless you know what you're and that's what at. I taught and that's oh, really? what I taught God. yes that's what I taught they yeah, and people taught. don't sometimes they might think okay well this guy was killed you know whatever who knows drug mm -hmm. deal got bad whatever mm -hmm. you know yep. and there's more to it than like well if you see like the you know they 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 nailed the cow tongue to the wall <laughs> maybe there's a hint that get a big mouth I don't know. It could be <laughs> just saying, but yes, that there was, um, there's a lot. And this is the, um, that's another thing I'm going to say as far as like, getting circling back to the ghost hunting, that there are times where you go on a paranormal investigation and is not a normal dead person. There's something darker there. And there's, mm -hmm. then there's other times that you say, I need to back out of this and call in somebody else to handle this because this is either a non-human entity or what's here is not just me getting EVPs or documenting or helping this person figure out, Hey, that draft is really not nothing. You have uh, to be, yeah. You have to be smart enough to know that you don't know. Oh yes. Yeah, Absolutely. You know, know, when to, when, know when to back off. Totally agree with you. Have you ever had any yourself or any of your team ever had any attachment or something follow them home? No, we we have a uh, um, probably a bad word to use, but a ritual that we do prior yes. to every investigation. We we say a prayer of protection prior to, and we say a prayer of protection at the end. And we make it very clear that nothing, because we believe that mm -hmm. if you do not give permission. You'll, you you'll normally be okay and then, and I'm making a very general statement here there's always there's always different uh things that may crop up but generally speaking we just say a prayer of protection before and after and say nothing can come home with us and we've been lucky we've not yes. had a problem yes and 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 I'm sure you've seen in some of these shows where they do the provocation or they oh. want to like and I'm thinking to myself what are you doing first of all yeah for all you might be doing is just a thin air but the metaphysical world that can be taken as an invite what you just said that you're saying no to the provocation mm -hmm. or confrontation if you mm -hmm. do have especially if you have a non-human entity or something really dark just a human mm -hmm. being that in life was a real sob mm -hmm. that they consider that as an invite you know like the vampire thing where you, you know yep. unless you invite them they yep. can't come in yep yep that yep basically what you're doing is i'm going to go toe to toe with you and you really don't know what you're trying to go toe to toe with Marlene, once again, this goes back to us not completely understanding what happens on the yeah. other side and too many of us in this field taking things lightly sure. yes. and not doing what we need to do to protect ourselves and doing what we need to do to understand what's going on the other side. So, and I, yes. once again, I, yeah. could, I could go on my soapbox there for an hour on that. Oh, no, no, that, but... no. You know, I, you, and the reason why I'm coming back to that, Larry is like what you mentioned, a lot of these, the paranormal shows, yes, we know for their entertainment, but there's, how's this? They want to make it dark, but in an entertaining way, like, ooh, it's a scary oh, yeah. thing. Was, but yeah. there is a much darker, or uh, if you don't know what you're doing, repercussions that come with this, if you don't know mm -hmm. what you're doing, or you think, uh, or even the or even the ones that think, ah, uh, you know, whatever, I can handle it's like, and in, in, um, I say, you know what? Sometimes people think that it's like the movies, like you're going to get haunted, you know, 72 hours later, you know, furniture's flying around in your place. And I go, you know what? Attachments or anything, whether it's negative energy or an entity, it's by in it's incremental, mm -hmm. right? It's little by little, you know, like, you know, that drop the Chinese water torture thing. So you got a <laughs> drop and a drop. And a drop. And then before you know it, things become unraveled. Yeah. And you're like, good luck. And, you know, some people will have the wherewithal to figure out. And also, let me ask you, have you done investigations on objects that had some type of attachment or something where people are saying, hey, ever, after I got this, is 
when things started going south? We have, but we really have not been able to determine that was the issue. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, we've really not been. I mean, we've we've had some some complaints like that, but nothing that we've been able to actually show it was coming from that that item. Oh, nobody's ever told you, hey, I want you to take that mirror or that lamp or that cane or that thing with you because I think or that portrait. You oh, know? oh yeah, yeah. But we say no, no. You need to get rid of it yourself. <laughs> It's, yeah, that's, it's like really the whole purpose of me having you come over and investigate is that I want to give this to you. No. Don't you have a museum somewhere you want to stick this? No, into? no, no. That's <laughs> no. That that's some other guy. Yes, <laughs> that's yes. some other guy. No. Let me ask you um, something real quick because mm -hmm. of your background, and you made mention of this and where the differences between doing residential investigations versus okay. going to historical spots or. Mm -hmm. You know, especially nowadays, uh, do you have any cautionary tales, especially for residential investigations? Because first of all, understand what our group is. I mean, we will help people like uh, we, mm -hmm. we just got a call recently from somebody that need needs some help and we're going to do that. But our group is a research group. We're trying to find answers. Uh, there are a lot of folks out there that do just residentials. Um and, and most of the time, frankly, I'm going to be honest, I don't know that they're they're really equipped to do that, but that's a story for a different day. Cautions about going into people's homes. First of all, you need to do thorough backgrounds on people when you're going into their homes. You need to know what the situation is. Uh, you need to know addictions, mental health, that type of thing. Biggest thing that worries me is, well, you did an investigation in my house. And, you know, I had a $50,000 bracelet on that dresser when you were here. Okay. And it's gone now. No, no, I've been a cop too long. I've seen too much of that. So, um, you know, be careful. If you're going to do a residential home, you need to have a, you, you need to have a representative there. That's my opinion. Many people don't agree with me, but yes. you need to have a representative there. Two reasons. First of all, they're there, they're watching. Okay. S second of all, sometimes if there's an entity there, they're reacting to that person anyway. And right. it may, you, you may actually get a better response when there's somebody there that they know, but you, you know, background, know who you're going into, whose house you're going into, make sure you got proper representation. If possible, have insurance. Um, be, but it's know whose house you're going into. Yeah. We, ha we, we would just, have a waiver. We would have them sign. Well, waiver, yeah, and, and waivers are good, but sometimes they're not worth. Oh, I know, written on. yeah, the, the waiver. Yeah, you have no so, way of putting it in the waiver because you never imagine that they're going to say, like you said. Yep. So that those are some of the things that you just need to be careful of, uh, and and there's folks out there that's what they want to do is go in and solve problems for people in their home, and I'm certainly not going to discourage that. Uh, just be careful. Sure. Yes, and one time I had a guest. She was showing me this movie. She did. She was a, like a, she was an exorcist, but with an order. And she was showing me this video where they had gone in to do an exorcism and they had taken a group to hold somebody down. And this guy, mm -hmm. and I'm looking at this and I'd be like, I would have been out of there. I would have taken my team and said, I'm out of here. This guy, I, supposedly possessed, but I, in my, in my opinion, he, he, he had some type of severe mental, this guy, first of all, he was banging around the room and he comes out and this guy's putting out cigarettes on his arm before they grab him and hold him down. And I'm thinking to myself, guess what? You might be possessed, but you're also crazy. Which, by the way, it's, you can have both. You can have a possession. Oh, oh I, I, with mental, yeah, with I, mental, I agree. You know, but once somebody's putting out cigarettes on their arm, it's like, this is where I need to get my team out of here. And they're holding this guy. And he's like, man, talk about, I, I've seen stuff like this where the, 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 how can I say it? The benefit to the client is like, okay, there's, it's beyond my, I can't, this is beyond me. In other it's words, beyond, there's yeah. nothing wrong with saying, like you said, I'm out of here. It's beyond me. No, it's no shame. Me. Well, not only is there no shame, but you've got to stop and think, is my presence here? Is what I'm doing making matters worse? Yes. Uh, I had one case where uh, my uh, 
uh, lead investigator and I went to talk. Some folks were having trouble in the house and we said, OK, we'll come and check it out. We came and we spoke to them and I won't go into any details, except I found out that, that both parties in the house were taking legal but prescri prescribed psychotropic drugs. Yes. And I just clearly said, look, I'll tell you what. You talk to your doctor first. If your doctor feels like this would be a good idea for us to come in, we will. We never heard from them again. Uh, uh, yeah, and, and, we, and you know why? Because the, when they asked the doctor, if they ever well, did. Well, the doctor would have the doctor would have said no. But we realized right up front there were, there was nothing we could do to help these folks. Even if there was a problem in there, they were they were dealing with so many physical issues, mental health issues mm -hmm. that all we would have done is made it worse worse and folks in this field have got to realize there's very few of us that can actually solve a problem as severe as a uh -huh. demonic haunting in a house sure very few of us that can actually do it are you helping or are you making the problem worse be smart enough be professional enough for lack of a better term to know when you should not be doing this of course, I and I had a situation like that. But one of the questions we had in that pre-interview is, "Are you taking any drugs prescribed?" And like, no sure. judgment here. We just we would like to know. I remember there was a case like that where both adults were taking for we're talking here the depression, depressive kind mm -hmm. of you know medication to address mm -hmm. depression. And I was like, okay, that's fine. By the way, this is a very nice area in Boca. Nice. We get there, and all of a sudden we're we're doing baseline readings in the house, and I look. And they're like, they're hanging out, you know, they have one of these islands in the kitchen and mm -hmm. they're both pouring themselves these big drinks, alcoholic drinks. I'm like, oh, I was like, what? I remember going like this, you know, when you have line of sight down like a hallway mm -hmm. from a room and I'm seeing this guy and I'm like, oh, this is not good. First of all, the credibility just went south. That's number yeah. one. Number two, it was like, okay, these people are mixing, you know, this type of prescription drugs with alcohol. This is not good, and I remember it was it, that was a very weird was a very weird case as uh they had they were they were saying that the grandmother had passed away was communicating through the mm -hmm. through an old computer and a cell phone it was electronic it was an electronic haunting, but yeah it was sure. one of those things where when I saw that it was like, and I remember it was like okay act normal, and there was a, a bunch of other things that cued us off, but when you see that that right there was like. Mm, you know, maybe there is something going on, but there's some part of this could be like. Sure. And that, and when you go into a house to somebody's residence, you need to, we had another case where Spanky and I went to another house. They were having problems and uh, we, we actually got called in by the city police department from that town mm -hmm. because one of their officers and the sergeant was in there and they saw a remote control fly across the room and it was dark in the room. And it freaked up. No, it was a Bible. It was a Bible. Okay. So they called us in and, uh, to make a long story very short, we found out that the there was a young man in there, a teenager who had emotional issues, and go. he was the one causing the problem. And he waited till nobody was looking, and he chucked, finally got him to admit it. Oh, really? The, okay. Uh, yeah, and and um, you know, being able to interview somebody and kind of get the <laughs> get a handle on, but. Be I was, careful I, you know, I thought things. you were going to tell me, are, are you talking poltergeist? Was, was you know, they, yeah. they say that a lot of those poltergeists is that you've got young adolescents in the home and no. you've got maybe displaced no. kinetic oh, energy. Oh, it, yeah. Oh, yeah, it's it his him. energy. It all right. Him. It was his energy. But once <laughs> again, that? we did, we did found that on the preliminary inquiry we, we did before we brought the whole team in there. So just be careful going into people's residences. Know, you you don't you know. Was that a relief for those officers who were there first? Thinking, oh yeah. Holy crap. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. A flying Bible. So. <laughs> oh yeah, that was that was priceless. So yeah, you know, talk about that. That's like the opening of a great horror flick. You know, <laughs> the officer goes in there, and I want to say one more on the way out. This is from a, a guest I had who was a police officer many many years before, and he was a rookie. Uh -huh. This yeah. was how oh, Marlene was it California? I can't remember. It was it was not Florida. So he says that he's going out was you know he's the rookie going out with his. Uh, you know, the senior officer who's teaching him. And right. he says that they go out to this house for this family that was constant calls for domestic violence. This was like all the time, all the time. It was like, oh, that address. Oh, we know. Oh, that. Oh, okay. So he says they go out there, right? And he says that when they get there, the family with the kids, 
the couple, they're sitting downstairs and they have this wigged out look on their face and they hear people arguing upstairs. And the senior officer who was knew them, you know, one of those things where you get, you know, like here yeah. I am again, again. Yeah, yeah. He's like, what's going on? And they're like, hey, no, no. And he says that they were like, they were like, that they, and he's like, who's upstairs? And they're like, there's nobody up there. But they're hearing stuff fumbling around and arguing. So this young guy, the senior police officer stays down with a family down on the sofa, down and downstairs, because they're not believing it. Like somebody's up there. Mm -hmm. So he says he goes up the stairs. And as soon as he gets to the top, it says it stopped. Like it went from arguing and stuff moving around to total like stop. And he says that he had to go in there with his, you know, with his gun out and he checked. I think yeah. it was like two or three bedrooms upstairs. He didn't find nobody. And he says that there was arguing. You could tell there was more than one person. Right. And he came down and the, and the senior cop, and he's like, there's nobody up here. The guy went up there. You know, the senior officer was like, man, these people are hiding and you didn't see them. He says that the family moved out a week later. He says that when he says when they walked in, the couple with the three kids or a bunch of kids that they had were all sitting on the sofa, like totally like, like they didn't know, like, and the cop is like, ah, well, you guys, you know, I keep waiting. Well, yeah, I'm having to come out here with you guys again. And who's up there? Nobody. Nobody's up there. They're like, what do you mean nobody? There's somebody up there. Tell me who that is. What happened? Nobody. And there was nobody there. And there was nobody there. So, yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah that yeah. happens. That happens. Yeah, that was one of those things. And then it was like, well, the, they, 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 in other words, they, they didn't even want to get the, they moved out. Like he said, like a week later, the family was gone. Bye. So, <laughs> yeah, you get a lot of weird stuff with the, uh, you know, that thing with the flying, uh, the flying Bible kind of deal. <laughs> Sometimes okay. you don't get off that easy to find out that it was the kid, you know, the human agency doing the, I have Aunt Larry. I have loved talking to you. We got you. We got to come back and talk about this uh, cult crime stuff. Cause people don't well, realize even historically that there's a lot of stuff that unless people and you know, most, I imagine most officers, if you get called to the crime scene or something, you're not looking for like, you know, you're just there to like, whatever you're called to respond and sometimes they don't see what what's there to be seen you know exactly and that that was always my goal open your eyes symbology open your eyes. Yeah. Good. yeah open your eyes understand what's going on and don't go in with such a closed mind that it couldn't be you always have to have an open mind no matter what kind of crime it is you have to have an open mind to drink in all the evidence so that you can solve the matter whether it's an occult crime whether or not it's yeah or anything right or anything yeah so yeah, so, so yes we, let's uh, well let's oh get back God, to the yes i would yeah. love to talk to by the way for my uh podcast listeners i'm going to have a link to your website on the credits but from other podcast listeners what's the best way to reach you oh uh, there's a couple ways you can reach me uh our website is paranormalfbi.com and that also hooks you into indianriverhauntings.com it's both they both go to the same site, but you can also reach me at ghostguy59 at gmail.com. Uh, okay. If you're interested in my uh, my show on the X Zone, you can check me out at um, Paranormal. I'm sorry. Let me get. Let me look right here. It's ParanormalStakeout.org. ParanormalStakeout.org. Right. When do you have? So when do you? When are you on the on the on the X Zone Radio? Do you have a certain day of the week? Well, no. We we tape it on Thursdays, doing one tomorrow night, and then it will go out on Friday. If you want, you can okay. either go to ParanormalStakeout.org or you can go to YouTube and sit, check out uh, Larry Lawson interviews. And my interviews come up on there also. Okay. And so my websites too. My Facebooks too. Facebook so uh, for they can find you whichever way they, they look it up. Me, yeah. They can find yeah. you. Do you have any? Are you? Uh, do you have any interesting cases on the horizon or anything like that? I uh, got got a couple, but I can't really get into them because, quite frankly, Marlene, one of them might be an unsolved homicide from years ago. So Ooh. we'll have to talk about that another time. I got to follow up with you on that because I okay. think that is that 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 would be so interesting. One of those things that uh, that's a cold case. You can tell him I watch I watch too much TV sometimes. <laughs> but uh, again, thank you so much. It has been wonderful. Good luck to you. I had a great time. Thank too. you for having me on. Likewise. Over. Take care. Bye-bye. We'll see you soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.
Oh boy. I'm telling you, I can pick his brains here and talk 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 and talk. Especially about what he just mentioned right now, a case that's tied into uh, an, a cold case or an unsolved case or an undiscovered case. Because um, the truth is that the, you know, we, we, you know, when, when we look at shows, all right, TV shows, I hate to say it, it we get, eh, again, let's, let's go back to what me and Larry were talking about. It's entertainment and entertain sometimes between entertainment or reality. There's a, there's a space there that, that something's missing. The point being that there's a lot of crimes that do not get solved. There's a lot of murders that do not get solved. There's a lot of victims that sometimes are never found. And if they're found, they're never even identified. Even to the point that sometimes it even makes it difficult if you don't know who it was or what happened to them. Um, because let's face it, when you have the identity of a victim, you could possibly find who killed this person because you look at who were they? Who was the family or who were they hanging out with? Where were they at? The, you know, um, did they, you know, in other words, there's a trail to lead back to a possible perpetrator. But if you don't know who this person is, good luck. And especially if this person has been, um, has been dead for a while, where maybe all, all you have is skeletal remains, if it was out and exposed, you know, in other words, this person, the, the remains have been sometimes years, sometimes all they'll find is a skull, you know, even though they have found, you know, a lot of cases have been resolved through DNA, you know, um, but if the remains have been exposed, sometimes that DNA is not that good. And then again, um, DNA is only, even, even if they're able to extract some type of DNA uh, sometimes the only way they get, they get lucky is like, you know, you have a family member who did one of those ancestry kind of deals. Hey, you guys. Shh. All right. Stop being so happy. Um, where basically they get a hit like, hey, they found maybe a cousin or three times removed. But another thing is if nobody's ever done that, sometimes, again, even with a even if they're able to extract any type of DNA evidence <clears throat> that doesn't guarantee, okay, you're going to be able to identify the person. Or even if you do, you're ever going to find who the perpetrator was, right? And once upon a time, obviously before DNA, <clears throat> where um, victims were identified through fingerprints and or dental, that's why you would have a lot of killers take off the hands and decapitate the person, or at the very least, take out their teeth because they knew the way to identify a victim. In other words, they understood identification of the victim will lead down to who the killer was because once you know the identity of the person, you'll say who was surrounding them. You know, that kind of deal. And of course, the most difficult type of crime to solve, which is a stranger on stranger crime, because there's no motives that a lot of times is what you know, predisposes somebody to murder, love, revenge, hate, business, you know, you, you did me wrong in business or, you know, organized crime kind of thing, you know, but in other words, but there's somebody in that orbit of that person that, but if you have a person who kills you, which, you know, a lot of these serial killers, that's what they did some, sometimes, not all the times where they would kill people. They didn't know who they were. They had nothing against them. Nobody owed anybody money. Nobody stole the person's wife's husband, girlfriend, boyfriend, nobody did them wrong. They just killed because they wanted to kill somebody. And maybe the opportunity arose. And um, they that those are very difficult. As a matter of fact, right today I was reading about cold case that was solved through DNA. Uh, there's this girl. This is out in Arizona, close to Prescott. It's one of these hiking trails. She's out there. She's 23 years old. Her name is Catherine Esposito. Esposito, I'm sorry, Esposito. Pretty girl. She goes out there and somebody killed her. They bludgeoned her to death, shot her with a 22 caliber in the eye and stabbed her. Talk about overkill. All right. Now, 
a lot of times, you know, especially with a stabbing, you think, wow, this, this is like a lot of hate. This is like, this is a personal thing. I mean, it, I mean, when I, when I read that to me, it was like, okay, how, how much can you kill a person once they're dead? You know, to me, it was like, I, I got either a lot of rage or something's going on with me. Some hikers not nearby heard her scream, but by the time they found her, it was too late. It becomes a cold case. Nobody knows anything. But apparently this person who was just recently identified or confirmed as the perpetrator had attacked and raped about three other times on that hiking trail. Now, guess who the guy was? 17-year-old high school student, right? A young man named, what was it, last name of Bennett? Brian Bennett. Okay. No connection between them. There was no, like, a, no, um, how can I say it? No history. No misunderstanding. No, hey, you, I want to be with you, and you, you know, gave me the cold shoulder. Now, what happens is he committed suicide in 1994, but in 2022, they exhumed his body. They were able to extract DNA. And the reason why I point this out is there's a difference when you have somebody that's been buried or, you know, processed, you know, like they're in a, thankfully he wasn't cremated, um, where versus skeletal remains that are left out in nature for years and years as far as the viability of the DNA. So now it was confirmed that he was the one that killed her. And apparently they they were coming down the, I, I imagine I haven't read the entire story of why they would think. And I think it had to do probably with these other crimes, these other assaults, sexual assaults that were committed in that same hiking thing. And that they took it, why he decided to kill her. Who knows? But it was finally after from 87, almost 30 something years the cold case was finally closed for the family, for him, forget it. He did, a, he was 23 years old, 23 or something when he killed himself in 94, he shot himself on the head. Okay. But for that family, at least it's like, or in some cases, you know, sometimes law enforcement or the family and, or the family kind of knows who did it, but they never have the proof to, to say, this is the person that committed the crime. And by the way, you can't prosecute somebody posthumously. All right. They could say, yeah, we have DNA evidence that says this is the guy that did it, but that's it. He's you can't take a dead man to trial and you know and convict him. He's dead. That's it. Yeah. And then as a matter of fact, a lot of these uh cold case DNA cases, when they finally zero in, you know, that they get a match somehow or other from a victim or skeletal remains or something, the person's dead. They sometimes say they, they've even been in prison for other crimes and they've passed away. All right. And, you know, I, I guess I'm that's the vengeful part of me, because the part is that not only this must be a horrible thing to have that, but the that the resolution is that this person will be punished and they're they're alive for you to see them punished. I don't care. I'm not the forgiving type when it comes to stuff like that. Far from it. Far from it. But in the worst case scenario, at least people have answers. But coming back to what Larry was saying. There's a lot of times victims which are discovered that sometimes <clears throat> there's victims that you can really, you can, you can say, are they really victims? There was um, a discovery. This is uh, Marlene. This is around, uh, there's an area here in Florida. It's a, believe it or not, it's a, it was, it's a very old place called Yeehaw Junction. As a matter of fact, I did a, a show on that. But back in the, so 60s, 70s, 80s, something like that. They discovered the skeletal remains of an older man out in these fields. Because remember, a lot of these areas back, be, you know, Florida, we, you know, we had a big uh, orange industry, you know, agricultural. And there was a lot of fields. Bottom line, he was found out in one of these fields. And by the time they found him, he was pretty much decomposed. And it looked like from, from what I read, it was like he was missing teeth. In other words, this, this looked like this was a homeless person that had been living out there, maybe felt bad and went and laid down and died. All right. In other words, 
sometimes you can find skeletal remains. This doesn't mean automatically that this person was killed. This person could have, if they have, you'd be surprised. I hate to say it. And it's very, very sad that sometimes there's people out there that have nobody to care or wonder if they disappear off the face of the earth to say, hey, what happened to so-and-so? Or to call the police and put in a missing persons report. They literally, for lack of a better word, they fall off the face of the earth and it doesn't raise a blip anywhere. And let's face it, if police, if nobody goes to the police and says, hey, I need to file a missing persons report or I haven't seen so-and-so in X amount of time, they don't, they can't, psychically, they can't figure that out. So again, some of these remains, you can't automatically assume that they're a victim of murder, All right? Maybe they laid down and died. As horrible as that sounds, that you know, the best thing you can do is go out to the field and it's like, I feel really bad. I'm going to crawl under this bush and I'm going to expire. But I got to follow up with him. I'm really fascinated by that. As far as the, you know, the, 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 when we, when we walk into the, the paranormal aspects of it, where, um, is, is this a victim that has been hanging out because let's how's this let's say this is a person that's killed and they are buried somewhere in the middle of nowhere they're never found okay they're they're never discovered the family i mean they suspect something's wrong let's say especially if this was like hey we know this person would just take off but there's no definitive proof to say this person was killed all right, especially when it's a stranger on stranger thing, by the way. And what if you have this person that stuck out there, the spirit of this person saying, I, I need to tell my family I didn't leave. This is what happened to me. This is, I, I didn't walk away from my family. I didn't like take off with somebody with a lover and assume a new identity in Mexico somewhere and I'm drinking, you know, margaritas. I was killed. My, especially if you have, you know, family, children, um, uh, you know, that could, that could make a, a, think about it as far as the sensibilities of a regular person that could bind you because it's like, I, I, I can't, I can't go on thinking that they would think that I would do this. Where maybe the discovery is the, it's the discovery and possibly or hopefully the identification is what liberates them to go on to the other side. All right. Yeah, things like that happen. What can I say? Anyway, guys, I hope you like the show. I really like speaking to Larry. Don't Like I said, there's going to be a link to his uh, website on the credits of the show. Don't forget to sign up for my newsletter on Substack. You can go to mppellister.com and sign up there. You can go to miamiogostchronicles.com and sign up there. Again, I have the video version and podcast, plat on podcast versions on different platforms all over the place. But... If you would like to listen to the podcast version of any of the shows, just go to MiamiGhostChronicles.com and I have a link there that will take you to where you can listen to the podcast either on the browser or download the MP3 file for without commercial interruptions, without commercial interruptions. All right. Um, the, uh, you know, uh, I have all, not, and not only stories of the supernatural, there's Nightshade Diary, there's Supernatural Storytime. I also have Eerie.News um, where I write the articles, whatever the case might be, check it out. All right. Especially if you want a little bit of the weird, um, it's all the, 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 how can I say the, the reality of the world? Like I said, when, you know, when you get the hurricane blowing stuff down and you've got like horrible events, like what happened in Maui and the world. And it's like, you know what? Let me just listen to some weird stuff. Now, it's entertaining, whether you believe in it or you don't believe in it, or it's just interesting, or you hear conversations with people like Larry Lawson about what their experiences are. You know, this is, you know, sometimes amidst all the crazy stuff in the world, you need to space out for a while and just listen to things. And then you come back and you deal with your reality, whatever it might be. All right. And sometimes that, what, what do you want to call it? That timeout, that, that headspace timeout. All right. Does wonders for you. That's wonders for you. Because all of a sudden it's like, okay, the world is still here. Because that's the thing, guys. Despite all the crazy stuff we got, the world, 
time stops for no man. Everything is still happening. All the things that we have to deal with as adults, no matter what, from time immemorial, all right, that have always been around, whatever your circumstances are, they're always going to be there. It's not like all these tumultuous things happen and you can you want to put the rest of this other stuff on hold. You know, let's put that. People still have to make a living. People still have to take care of their families. People have to deal with uh, difficult situations or good stuff or preparations or, uh, you know, things of this nature. You know, the, none of this house going to tell you the, 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 your individual scenario of your life will go forward with the backdrop of all this other stuff that's going crazy in the world. And by this, I'm not saying ignore it, but at the end, it's time. Like I, I'm, I'm going to go and space out a little while with Marlene and listen to some kooky stuff. Why not? Anyway, guys, please come back. I have a lot of great, great guests lined up. And like I said before, I'm working on releasing my book, hopefully this year. And going into season 15 of Stories of the Supernatural. And of course, I've got a lot. I've got I've got a, a lot of good guests, people coming back from the past, new people like Larry. I mean, I've got people all the way, I've got guests lined up all the way into 2024 20, and beyond. All right, that I've contacted, and they're going to be gracious enough and come and talk to me, you, and everybody about whatever it is that they're into. Till next time. Take care. And remember, you're all wonderful.